It's, it's fucking, wherever I am, it's beautiful. Um, to steal words from Bill Hicks. Um, so thanks for having me here. It's very cool to be here. And um, before I start, are there just two people I would like, well, two things I want to say is thanks. I want to thank Ross. Uh, in fact, hipsters everywhere who've worked tirelessly to legitimize people with ginger coloring. Um, uh, well done on that score. And then also, um, a lot of people thank God for stuff. Um, I just feel that's disingenuous because he doesn't exist. So I want to, <laughs> I'd like to thank Apartheid. Because um, um, if I'm really honest about it, that's probably why I'm standing here. Uh, I know a lot of people say they didn't benefit. Well, fuck you. You're lying. Um, I did. I had a great childhood because of Apartheid. I know it was wrong, but there you go. Um, so that's how I just thought I would like to start. So, so I have slides. I don't like using them. I'm going to try and see what happens. But I thought I would, um, you know, probably start with things that you would expect from me. Because probably the most shocking thing that will happen today is that I'm, I'm not really going to try too hard to shock you. I want to talk about shock. I don't really want to, um, you know, I don't really want to just shock you. That's so easy. Um, what is your name? Daniel. <laughs> That's a nice religious name. Well done. That's beautiful. So, so I, I think that a lot of people assume uh, like that I'm you know, all about shocking people for the sake of shocking them. So I thought the first thing we should do is maybe just um, talk a little bit about this fucking pointer. Um, oh, now it's gone twice. Okay. Um, so this is a, a really nice Ron English painting. When I grow up, I'm going to buy one. Um, but I, I have never found a painting that more um, aptly describes how I feel most of the time. From the time that I started growing up until even today, the reason why people find me shocking. I think it's really important to, um, to understand that we, we kind of live in a very strange time, I think. Because it was actually simpler in the old days to, um, to understand the situation. That, that's my feeling. They were good and bad. I mean, that was the idea growing up in South Africa. They were the bad guys who were in charge, and then they're the good guys who weren't. But we've grown up into a much more complicated environment now. We're not quite sure who the good guys are anymore. We're also not sure why we were bad and whether the bad part of us still exists. See, I'm a big believer that I do have an inner racist. I don't lie about it. I think it's really, really stupid to pretend that you don't have hard wiring in your body and your mind that is actually against other people. I believe we have that. I see it in my daughter. I see less of it in her. The programming is getting better. The way that I interact with my friends versus my parents is better. There's an evolution going on. So that's very important. However, I still catch myself with a bad guy in my head. And it doesn't have to be about race. Like I'm not only talking about race. It's just easier to see race because it's such an obvious one for all of us. I see it as a, as a marker. Somebody once said, if you think of cigarette smoke as a, as a, as a marker, you know, when you smell someone else's cigarette smoke, it's not about the cigarette smoke. You're inhaling their breath. That's the fucking weirdness of how like, close we all are, right? So I use race as a marker, my approach to race in my own head. And if all I can do is get the racist in my own head to shut the fuck up uh, and be quiet and be ignored and get outvoted every time my head has a meeting, then there's evolution going on. Like my daughter will probably end up having less screaming in her own head and then her child will be better and eventually it will solve itself. But growing beards and having fucking artisanal woolly polonex, it doesn't make you special or caring. It's just another way of telling us all that you're really insecure. So, 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 so that's what I want to I wanna talk about is why you might see it as shocking. I, I don't see it as that. I, I just see the truth. Um, often people talk about the truth uh, when they talk about shock. I, I don't see it like that. Uh, I'm a psychopath. I was raised in a racist environment. The, the fact that I'm a psychopath is perfectly normal. That's what happens when you grow up in a, in a weird environment where nothing makes sense. So like my, my, you know, everything around me as a child growing up in my formative years told me that black people were dangerous and incompetent and evil. Then my parents went to work every fucking day and left me alone with one. Um... Yes, I, I, I am angry, and, and, so, and, so, and so that's why I, I love that painting. So, so this is the thing. We have this kind of like this new approach to the world, which is we, we, we know and see everything, and that's this kind of new, super-friendly, kind of uh, cultural, all-seeing eye. But I, I panic about it a little bit, because with all those social media shit going on, 
shock becomes a very difficult thing to understand because the way we share things and how we share outrage and how we highlight things that are supposed to be shocking has become much bigger. And I wonder if it is actually more democratic or whether we are now creating a new kind of hysteria and a new kind of censorship because I'm not sure that everyone calling out every single person on every single possible possible um, contravention of what we've decided is humanity is a good idea. There's also a chance that we've handed censorship to everyone. I don't know that everyone deserves the right to be a censor. I really don't. If we don't believe in censorship, oh, is us becoming the new censor the answer? That's a huge question for me because now we, 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 this thing of being offended becomes so fucking important. I'm offended. Well, okay, fuck. So what now? Like, must we all fucking change our plans because you're upset? We don't know what your prejudice is. We don't know where you come from. We don't know why you're offended. I don't see offense as an injury to someone. I see it as shining a torch on someone else's bigotry. Because generally, only when prejudice is, is hurt do we call it offense. I don't understand what offense is. And the reason I want to talk about that is because that has a lot to do with shock. What we see is shock. So I just did some thinking about this, and, and I think it's really important that we... Okay, you can't even... The great projector, by the way, created <laughs> mornings. This is a piece of shit. Um... <laughs> That's actually a picture of the, of the pilot that was captured and set on fire. Um, we must be very careful that we, 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 we uh, differentiate between what is trauma and what is shock. Because I believe with all the social media and all the other shit that we've done, we've allowed shock to become trauma. And that's doing ourselves a disservice. That's not actually correct. A trauma is something totally different. Trauma is real. Okay? That's a real thing. And I don't mean just being set on fire. I mean seeing that is traumatic. I, mean, I know it's quite shallow. You know, imagine how I felt. I had to watch it. Um, um, but we seem to have almost allowed art to be uh, judged by the same criteria as real events. And that's a problem for me. I, I'm not talking about trauma today. I would never presume to. Um, um, I see that all the time. People start discussing you know, shock from the point of view of trauma. And if we do that to ourselves, we make ourselves weaker. It's not acceptable to me that you just replace shock with trauma. Okay, we've got to be very careful what trauma really is because that's a really like deeply personally, physically or mentally or spiritually like dangerous thing. Just realize that as an atheist talking about spirituality is a bit strange. I'm talking about shock. So that's what I've chosen to talk about today, and I've chosen to define it this way, because everything I'm going to tell you is my opinion. You don't have to believe it. I don't, I don't expect you to have to you know, go with what I'm saying. If I can just provoke you into an argument, that's perfectly successful, because that's what shock's all about. It's to provoke. It's just to give you an experience to shock you out of uh, what your current situation is. And I started talking from the point of view of race. The reason I discuss race the way I do on stage is I, need to, I feel I need to shock people out of the kind of complacency that we're in. As far as I'm concerned in South Africa, we've settled into a kind of a, a, a compromise. We've done enough work on race and now we'd like to move on and we haven't even started. We haven't really understood what's going on and, and there's proof of that. Students are fucking shit up and you know what? Good for them. I'm really glad they're breaking shit. Because we can break some shit in this country if it'll get people to pay attention to the fact that we haven't sorted shit out. We can pretend we have and we can make beautiful graphic design and fucking have our little eight rand cup of free coffee outside. But that doesn't change the fact that we're in a tiny minority. And the black people who've benefited are also in a tiny minority. And we have to actually address that shit now. We have the benefit of certain things. We have like a freedom. We have certain rights to be heard. We have certain rights to gather. People have got rights to education. But are we doing enough with it? That's, that's what I, I want to talk about. Because my thing is about becoming better. All of us should become better. Less judgmental. More understanding. More tolerant. Like These are all important things for me. And shock is not something you just do by getting up and going, Hey, fuck Jesus. Um, there's no point to that. But if it will shake you out of complacency, that's quite important. We mustn't think that a new conservatism replacing an old conservatism is good enough. I don't think it is. Because for me, comedy is just a vehicle. It's a way in which we provoke people into thinking. Um, I know a lot of people say, but comedy is when you make people laugh. Sure, but great comedy for me is when you make them laugh and think. Like, I don't think that slapstick shit is my kind of comedy. I've never liked, so I never liked Bill Cosby. Funny enough, there was something about him. I just didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like him. I thought that the Huxtables were too perfect, you know? Nobody ever fingered anyone in that program. Um, 
It's all a bit too perfect. I never liked Lance Armstrong. Fuck that guy. I never liked him. Never liked that one bald fucking doper. I just, I can't. And those are important things for me because I've always spoken against those wholesome images. And it is so fucking rewarding when they come crashing down. Because of the judgment that I see passed on other people. And all we've done is design a camouflage that allows the respectable to get away with fucking murder. You know, the Vatican. It's a big baby raping place. It's crazy. Right? Don't say Jesus. He wasn't involved, you bastard. Um, and I'm defending him as an atheist. Um, you know, we don't talk about that stuff. We don't talk about the fact that the Catholic Church basically has allowed people to rape children for, for decades and centuries. Because it's too, it's, it, that's shocking, right? But we need that shock. We need to get over that shock. Those children are not going to be unraped, right? We can't fix that. So, so, so when we talk about shock, I think we must just be sure to understand why certain people use shock as a tactic. It's fucking working for ISIS, I'll tell you that much. Um, so, so this is a good example of where shock became trauma, right? Not a great magazine. I don't know how many of you ever read Charlie Hebdo and probably don't even give a fuck about it anymore because you haven't thought about it since this happened. A lot of people suddenly started tweeting, Je suis Charlie, like you didn't even understand what that meant. You were saying by sending that hashtag that you're prepared for someone to walk up to you and put a gun in your mouth and ask you if you back this cartoon. And if you said yes, they would shoot you in the head. Do you understand that concept, right? A lot of people are not in a position to say, Je suis Charlie, until you've had the death threats. And I'm not talking about Steve Hoffman. That doesn't count, right? <laughs> but I had a really good conversation with uh, Zapiro on the radio. He's a great guy, Jonathan. He's one of the few people in this country allowed to actually talk about whether he is Charlie or not. Everyone else, until you've actually had the gun aimed at you, I don't give a fuck what you think, seriously. Because what you're telling people is you can kill every single one of us and we'll still be here until they put the gun in your face. We make these enormous like, statements and that's why I'm saying to you, I don't know if we talk about shock from the right point of view. There are some very brave people in the world. They will say, I believe in this shit and yes, you can shoot me. We aren't all of them. Not all of us are that person. It doesn't work like that. Until you've been in that situation, easy on the hashtags. Because you create this culture that we are all brave and all forward thinking. All you've done is type and hit send. You are not fucking committed to this process. Don't pretend you are. This was not, is not a great magazine. They weren't doing brilliantly. They, they spiked when everyone got killed. Great campaign. <laughs> but I'm almost certain they haven't kept the same numbers. So, so what happens is when you get all like crazy people talking about shock and stuff, it crosses over. Obviously, that became a big trauma. Now suddenly we've, we're invested because now there's tragedy. Okay? It's just interesting to me. So I looked at some shock art and, and you know, f from that point of view, I mean, we have to ask ourselves, are these truly shocking things? I don't know if you know the guy on the top side. He's an art student. Uh, he was plagued his whole life by this faulty hip. And uh, he suffered incredible pain, discomfort, ongoing operations, until finally it was removed and replaced with synthetic um, stuff. So for his art project, he cooked and ate his own hip. Uh, okay, you're gasping, but like, I have to ask myself, did you have to eat the hip? No. So why the gasp? He did it. Why? why? Perhaps it's not shock. It's just leaving the familiar. And that's why I think shock is so important. That's just a really eloquent essay on the nature of our president's reign. At one point, all we knew him for was his cock. That's all we knew about our president. That's why he was famous, because there was a rape charge, and there were lots of children and many wives. He's a swordsman. His cock was more famous than him. The terrible tragedy of our president now is that we wish all we remember of him when he's gone was his cock. Now there's much worse shit going on. So that's just an essay. And, and there's just a Mario brother crushing a pope because, you know, we set these things up. Like, is the shock actually the act of the person shocking or is it just the prejudice in the mind of the people being shocked exploding? Because the truth is, why wouldn't you eat a hip? If we think about it physically, it's not like you ate someone else's hip and they didn't have a hip anymore. You can eat a lamb, but you won't eat a dog or your own hip. So 
Is it shocking or is it just an untangling of your own prejudice? See, this is what I'm saying is once you understand that it's not just Marilyn Manson vomiting or coming on the audience, they're inviting you to look at your own prejudice. That's what's really, really important to me. And I, and I hope you understand that I'm not asking you to only factor this in race. If you think about everything you've ever done, there are strange things. And you might think it's shocking that I say that black people, if you honestly believe that there's a little green man living under your bed with a huge cock, you are fucking retarded. <laughs> I don't care if it's your culture. It's fucking stupid. And to teach a child to be afraid of an imaginary thing is a fucking cruel act. Right? And that goes for any white person who spoke about the bogeyman. You are fucking stupid. Right? If you're a fat person and you're unhappy, stop fucking eating. End of conversation. Right? Now you see these things as shocking. How can you pick on fat? Because I'm trying to fucking help them. It's really simple. Too many calories, pal. So, so but now we've built all of these little things around, these little cushions around ourselves. And all that shock art is trying to do is to bash those things away because they're pointless. Why is the Pope sacred? Fuck the Pope. Seriously. He's not my Pope. If there's a king of another country, fuck the king. He's not my king, right? I'm a human. I believe that we're all equal. Yes, you've got a crown. All right. There's a bit of protocol. But that doesn't mean if we're ever in a fucking situation that I'll take a bullet for you, China. No chance. Fuck off. You've had a great life. Fucking poping yourself around all day. And if you're the Pope, why the bulletproof glass, Mr. Fucking Ye of Little Faith? So, so, so I think it's, it will always remain supremely important for me, supremely important, that we constantly question, check, and, 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 uh, and, and yeah, we'll question what we believe in. Because the truth is, like, I have a huge issue with religious people defending God if what they say about God is true. If you believe God to be an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present being, what the fuck does he need you for? To like protect him from me. Surely he could just reach down and I'm gone, pal. It's over. So, And if there is a God, if I do meet him, I'll discuss it with him when I see him or her, right? Because I'm not going to discuss it with you because apparently you're flawed. You've got original sin. You ate the apple. So you're fucked. I'll talk to the boss when I see him. Thank you. May I see your supervisor? <laughs> so, see, so, so I just, and, and I feel we would be better people if we constantly and bravely fact checked everything we believe in. Seriously. So if I ask if God exists, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a, a heretic, right? So you're telling me that God is then going to uh, like fuck me up because I just asked to see some ID. That's incredible. Or like, if you kill yourself, you can't go to heaven. But that's a bit weird. I love you. You must come here when you die. Just don't come early. That's like your dad inviting you for Sunday lunch with your girlfriend, and then you arrive half an hour early, and he just shoots your girlfriend. What the fuck are you talking about, right? doesn't make any sense. So this is very important for me, is when you are presented with something which you find shocking, stop accusing the artist of being to blame, and look at your own prejudice. Pick it apart. I'm not suggesting I would ever eat my own hip. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying I don't really think I need to add my outrage to the world. What I do need to do is pause and think about what does that really mean to me? Really. It's just an interesting thing. So this symbol has come to be shocking to all of us. Completely shocking. And why is it shocking? You, sir. You don't know why ISIS's flag is shocking. Fucking seriously. Are you just scared to answer me now because you feel, Jesus, he's a bit fucking firm. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you not sure why that's shocking? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly why. Because we're all shit scared of those people. Because I've seen clips on the internet. They just shackle a man to the ground and drive a bulldozer over him. Or they put a man in a cage and set him on fire. Or they machine gun women because they won't fuck them. <laughs> all in the name of an all-loving God. It's very interesting. So this symbol has become something which means something to all of us, right? So they've achieved their purpose. In my world, oh, look at that. This symbol should be as terrifying. How many fuck-ups in the world, how much suffering, how much like evil has been perpetrated as a result of fucking executives meeting? Much more than ISIS. Much, much fucking more. But they've done it in a way that is okay with you. 
because it's gradual and it's under the table and it's within the respectability and I'm sure they've all got golf club memberships and drive four by fours around Santon and they've got homes in Plettenberg Bay and therefore that's fine. These people have fucked up the world a lot more, a lot more than ISIS. This is why shock artists need to exist because they have to remind you that while you've polarized everything in your mind, good guy, bad guy, these are the fucking bad guys. Like we don't hold these people to account ever and if art doesn't do it, what the fuck is going to do it? Do you know what I mean? Because everyone sitting here is in the creative business. You'll, you'll, you'll say yes, yes to a point until you're working with these people again on Monday. And then suddenly, no, they're not that bad. No, they are fucking bad, right? But if we don't tell them, who will? It's our job as artists. We're the court jester. We sit right near the king. We're the only one allowed to talk about it. I met with Edwin Cameron the other day. What a fucking great man. Fucking superb human being. And I asked him, like, what is my protection? Because I've been found guilty of hate speech by the, by the BCCSA, and I've been had death threats from Steve and death threats from Hindu people in Durban. Like, I've had all kinds of shit go on, right? And well, it's a bit unfair of Hindus to make death threats because they got reincarnation. Fuck them. They don't even, they just come back. <laughs> and actually, if you read their book, they're supposed to be pacifists. They must calm the fuck down. But, um, but I just feel that like, if you are constantly and easily shocked, you don't see this shit from a new angle. You don't understand this vibe. Do we not understand that like, in this country, we have marriage and then gay marriage? Do you know how fucking inhuman that is for the most liberal constitution in the world? How is gay marriage different? How is the union between two people different to a union between two other people? How the fuck? How dare you call a marriage gay? What does that mean? Well, I don't even know what that means. We have, we have human rights and gay rights. We're fucking inhuman. Like, that's the bottom line. How do you have different rights for different humans that are human? What? It makes no sense. But it's because we never fucking, we never do this. We never go through the mental work of understanding what it is we've actually voted for. So, so this is a huge thing for me. If you look at this page, I mean, just, just these symbols on this page have created more devastation, suffering, fucking loss, acquisition, crimes, incest, rape, murder, cannibalism. I mean, these fuckers are like, I mean, these are, the ISIS flag is a pussy compared to this piece of paper. But we don't ever say that. It, it's not comfortable. It's really not comfortable to talk about it. So, so now, we've moved from race to religion. <laughs> We're ticking off all of the biggies. I think we popped past politics. But what I want you to do is not blame these things, right? It's our prejudice that does the damage. It's not these things. It's our reaction to them. It's our ability to be hypnotized and romanticized and kind of taken hostage by these things. Because we are the ones who are supposed to react appropriately. And we don't. We don't do it. We tend to settle into a very nice compromise. As long as I get my fucking home and my things and my friends and my little pattern and I have enough, it's fine. I'll just trade away. There are some very brave people who question this all the time. It's not, it's not popular. It's, it's not something which is easy. Uh, it's difficult and often ends in, in, in quite serious uh, suffering. But it's fucking important. And if anything, if all you leave with today is an idea, just fucking stop and think about it. Let's give you an idea. Who drove here today? Who saw a taxi? Who was stopped by a taxi? Okay, and how does that make you feel? You don't get angry about it anymore. And what do you get? Because it's like the weather, you can't change it. It's like the weather, you can't change it. Yes, you fucking can. There is global warming, fucker. Um, um, <laughs> we did that. Um, <laughs> you can't change the weather. That was so true in the 80s. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but I like your approach. You've given up, and that's quite cool. Reframe it, which you've kind of done. I'm actually agreeing with you. Um, we live in a country where cheap labor is kind of responsible for a lot of the things that we enjoy. Um, it's one of the reasons why we have the economy that we do. There's a great economy for a small group of people, and uh, underneath that group there's an enormous amount of cheap physical labor. And if they didn't like it, they could fuck off, we'd find someone else. That's the bottom line historically here. Yeah, we did it with Indian people when they cut sugar cane, and then we went back to black people when the Indians got too clever and it was too difficult, right? So, so what I'm saying to you is that the way that those people are transported every day was an informal system. It was like the Uber for cheap labor. 
It just came about. They're everywhere. They're affordable. They get you where you need to go. But they were never funded. They were never, ever given infrastructure. They were never, ever given legislation. They were never given any form of support. These are like black entrepreneurs who came up with a solution. It's not perfect. I understand that. But like, what is perfect? Pick and pay. Fuck. You know, what, what does that mean? How dare you judge them differently? So, so they now mobilize that workforce every morning. Okay, you don't mobilize your workforce. No, I don't. The lady who cleans my house does everything in my house for a fraction of my salary, but she has all the needs that I do. Family, food, education, medication, da 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 She does it on a fraction of my salary, willingly. Okay? So how did I expect her to get to work? In a fucking E-class? No. I'm not fetching her. I don't have time. It doesn't suit my day. So she arrives the way she can, and then I penalize her for it. Not only that, I complain that they are dangerous. She's in the fucking car. She's in the death trap, getting to my shit-paying job. And then if she doesn't arrive, I'll accuse her of African time. Do you know how long the average stop is with a minibus uh, at a time? A taxi will stop you for about 45 seconds. Rough average. Maybe two a day. That's 90 seconds of your own time you've been asked to invest in this informal transport system and you feel that's unreasonable. <laughs> we are really fucked in this country and it's not because of Jacob Zuma. We suck. It's just an idea. Use it, don't use it. Um, so this is a simple thing of questioning the Bible. Very popular book. Uh, there's a guy called Gideon. He hates it. He fucking leaves his copy behind every time he goes to a hotel. Um, when I was four, my mum thought I was ready to understand the Bible. So she kind of, st my mum's a Christian and she's actually a very nice lady. She's, she believes in all the good shit. Like she's, she's kind and she's kind of charitable and she's just caring human being. She has a habit of um, caring for everyone, which can be frustrating uh, because it comes at her own expense. But, but anyway, um, my mum tried to explain the Bible. So the reason I did that whole speech about my mother is I want you to understand the context was actually a very loving, good example of what I would say a Christian could be. Um, um, because in theory, they're lovely people, right? Um, <laughs> when they're not crusading or fucking, you know, touching children. But, but um, so, so she explained to me that there was nothing and then there was a word and then the word kind of split the light and the dark, which, I mean, from a physics point of view, really doesn't hang together. But then... There was the, the land and the sea, um, which they, was then separated. And then uh, from the mud, which is a combination of both, then a man was made. Um, so he's some kind of supernatural golem. And then um, he, well, it must have been disturbing because obviously you burst into consciousness fully formed because obviously you couldn't be a baby because there was no one there to look after you. So you would, it would have to be sort of, I don't know, 18. Um, that's got to be fucking terrifying to suddenly burst into existence between heartbeats, you are not there, rah, and then fucking, what the fuck? And like, you don't even have words, or you don't know what limbs are, or fucking anything. You're a conscious, I mean, that's fucking ridiculous. Um, um, not even evolution will do that to uh, anything. You've got to start off small, one cell, then you two, then you maybe a tadpole when you're lucky, then maybe one foot, try that out for 12 years, and then maybe the, you know, like it's a slow fucking iPad 4, didn't come, f didn't. so, so. So anyway, he was born, and then, you know, obviously God spoke to him. That had to be a shit fucking clearing experience. And then um, he got lonely, and then God obviously made him go to sleep and then took a rib out and some other things and then made a woman, because that's apparently what you are. And then um, they were thrown out of a garden because a snake gave them an apple. Um, fine. Uh, I was young, so I, I went with that because I was four. I wanted to be a fireman. I was prepared to listen. And then um, after that, um, they had two sons, and so... Wowzers, did I press all those buttons? And you fuckers didn't say a word. All of you. Um, and that as well. What's so, funny is, what's so funny is that's pink in the original presentation. And the market is so against that, that kind of prejudice that it made it purple. Um, so, so here is um, Adam and Eve and then the two boys and then what? Because that's a really fucked genetic tree. Um, what are we saying here? I mean, what are we saying? Because I said to my mum, but hang on, if there were two boys, then who did they, how did, it, how did we, I mean, what? Uh, and she said, well, you mustn't really, uh, you must have faith. At four, I knew I was in shit. I was like... It's a fucking long book and we're on page seven. And really, that's your best answer? 
We've hit children about this. We've told them that they're evil for even asking that question. So from a very small age, our deepest kind of fears are that we'll be, we'll be in trouble for questioning. And I, and I need to tell you that that's not true. If the Bible is worth anything, it can handle a few questions. You should be allowed to question everything. And in fact, the things you hold dearest, you should question the most. It's not the other way around. We tend to question things we don't like because we're trying to poke holes in your shit. Stop that. Poke holes in your own shit. Find out what, 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 what you believe that might be up to bullshit. Because then you have a much more honest engagement with people when you do. So, so I find if I've interrogated my own shit, that's how I'm able to talk to an audience much more honestly. Because th- we now have each other's, like, you know, I have your best interest. I'm not looking to destroy your shit. I want you to question your own. So when I ask you questions, it's not the first time you've ever had a hole poked in your fucking story. I can't believe that there's some people who still can't answer that question. Surely that's the first fucking question that was ever asked by anyone who's fucking read a book or thought or fucking, I don't know, had a sperm inside them. I, I don't know. Like, whatever makes you fucking, because I have a theory that sperm is a, is a stimulant. Um, once it leaves a man, we really struggle to stay awake. <laughs> and once it goes into a woman, they just want to talk all fucking night. Um, um, so, I think it's Red Bull in our bags. Um, wow, these pictures are... Uh, well, this is quite interesting. Um, so, what happened is it's developed to quite an interesting uh, world view. I, 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 um, these are various homoerotic images that I pulled off the net. So, I see rugby. Um, is this incredible celebration of men by men. I, I love it. Like, it's an amazing... I love rugby because it shows me... My dad's quite an intelligent guy. He's like a reader. He's a writer. He's, he's a very open-minded human being. But once a week, he screams at a television screen. And I've never understood... He's quite an overweight guy. And, and I just wonder, first of all, they're not in the screen. Um, they are miles away, those particular people. And then secondly, I'm not quite sure why they would take advice from you. Because they are hand-picked athletes, and you are an obese guy. So, just asking for a friend. Um, and then I, on the radio once, had a debate saying that, is rugby just a big homoerotic celebration? And, um, and a man phoned me and said, fuck you, man. How dare you fucking whatever. And you, you must come to Loftus. You're going to see your ass. And I'm like, there you go again. You're obsessed. Um, with the anus. It wasn't Steve Hoffman. It was someone else. He doesn't actually have an accent like that. But, uh, but thanks, Roy. Um, so, so as a result, this is a little boy on a, on a bike facing riot police. I feel that's how my, my, my childhood was. Um, it always felt like that from the time that I, I sort of started realizing that things were fucked. And, and nobody seemed to worry about it. It all seemed perfectly fine. It seems easier to join the riot police than be the kid on the bicycle. And w- what I want to recommend to all of you is that, that you try and be the kid on the bike because it's not as dangerous as you think. Um, it's, it's not, we're not talking about trauma, remember? We're talking about shock. I'm not asking you to put yourself in harm's way, but just be that kid on the track as often as possible because it's, it will give you a much better view of the world. It will give you a much better experience. And, and honestly, like it used to be a theoretical discussion for me. I honestly believe if we don't sort this shit out, we are not going to fucking make this country work. It's not up to business anymore. Those are not the good guys. It's not up to the politicians. They were never the good guys. And that's not an Afro-pessimism thing. Governments don't fix shit anywhere. Anywhere in the world. They're administrators. We chose them and we hate them. That's their job. They're filthy people doing a filthy job. They're not our people. They don't help us. They never will. Whoever thought the DA was great, you're being slightly racist. And now they're a kind of a, you've seen that they're not perfect either. So, so, so it's up to us. And, and the way we're going to solve it is by putting out the right sort of messages. I think the way we create art, whether it's commercial or, or, or um, purely for creative reasons, it has to be conscious, because what's the point of fuck? It's like comedy that's fluffy. Why the fuck would you do art that doesn't have a point? I don't understand it. So I'm not so big on the hipsters. I mean, you guys are cute, but I don't know that you're the answer. You know, At some point, Markham's is going to change ranges, and then what the fuck are you going to do? Um, so, so I questioned every... This isn't working anymore. Um, Wow, I love this guy's work. Um, so, is it going to stay there? So, back to this picture. If I can sum up my, my kind of, I don't know what you call it, my journey from being that kid looking at the riot police to where I find myself today, which is quite cool because I find myself in a position of some power and I find myself in a position of uh, independence. And most importantly, I find that my business that I've, that I've got um, runs on an, on an honest 
uh, footing with my clients. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty open to listening to them, but I'm really firm on what I will and won't accept. And I find that in advertising particularly, the cock is so far down the throats of those agencies that they've almost lost their teeth, their creative teeth. And, and you know, you need to refresh every now and then. Like, I love running massive corporate events, but I need to go and create a theater show every now and then just to remember what it's like to make art or paint something and, and do an exhibition or fucking cook a really creative meal. Just do something that's a pure creative act. So, so I, I feel that um, it was a series of shocks that allowed me to be where I am today, to my own system. And, and it, 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 was, it was a wild cocktail of being the alienated kid, first of all, because I was physically kind of strange. I was kind of chunky, and, and, uh, and I had a very odd, unathletic childhood. Um, I was always friends with the outcasts in the group, so I wasn't big on wasps. I, I've never really been a fan of the country club. I still feel weird going there. Um, I'm not Jewish, um, just in case you were wondering. A lot of people have said, oh, yeah, you, you've got a rabbi. I have a friend who's a rabbi, but I'm really a lapsed Presbyterian, um, half Greek, ex Zimbabwean. I don't know what the connection is. That's, again, prejudice but it doesn't matter. I'm very happy to have a rabbi friend. He can strike you with a fucking plague if, he, if I ask him to. <laughs> Such a strong sense of power. Um, being insecure, it's a brilliant place of power. Um, it, it's not good at the time, but, but it can lead to incredible things. Um, um, I cannot tell you how much anxiety has saved my life. It's a brilliant thing because it's a great driver. Um, we all strive to give our children and our friends the perfect life. You are fucking enabling weakness. I'm just letting you know. Creatively, not great food. Contentment. It's not a great place for artists. So not a lot of people have had a nine to five, great coffee and reasonable unit trust collection and you know their taxes are up to date, have produced world changing work. So that's quite important. And then I, I really cannot thank the drugs enough. I really can't. Um, I know it's not a popular statement. I hope my daughter never sees this talk. But, um, but I have to tell you that those create complications uh, for you that can kill you, but if they don't, um, they, and you can get beyond them, uh, it d definitely does open doors. Um, um, I think Blake said that the, 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 road, the, the, ex the road of excess leads to the Palace of Wisdom. I know what he was talking about, but it's also dodgy because you can also end up at the Palace of um, Fucked Up, being fat, burpy, and average um, if you don't use the drugs. Sorry? Okay, Roy, the way this is going to work is I'll do the jokes and you do the drawing. Um, um, <laughs> there'll be a, a lot more rewards. And, and um, so it's a series of being angry, disappointed, alienated, fucked off, uh, and, and afraid. And I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, being afraid is a very fucking important thing. It is such an important thing uh, for me that people are afraid because it's, it's not that you learn to not be afraid. That means you're insensitive and it means that you don't know what's going on around you. You become impervious. Impervious is not good. Impervious is like snorting coke and then doing stand-up. It doesn't make you funny. It makes you really, really shit as a comic because you lose that fear. So, so do not be scared of being afraid. Fucking embrace that shit. It's very important. Um, I would say shave off your beards and face the world, you fucking bastards. Anyway... <laughs> And uh, I wish you could see this art. In fact, do yourself a favor and Google Ron English if you haven't already. I just love, because I see myself as almost, this is what I've kind of become at the age of 42, is a monster. But it's a cool monster. And uh, it's a combination of all that shit that I went through um, that puts me where I am today. And hopefully more shit will come and then I'll you know, evolve again. But, uh, but I would encourage you to, uh, to be very brave and, and question everything. And see shock for what it is. It's a very useful tool. It's not just a thing that you do to upset people and make them gasp when you eat your own hip. There's a lot behind it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's never perfect. But, but, but give it a go. Embrace shock. It's, it's an important thing. And see it almost as, for me, it's a duty. It's something I have to do. Because I have to keep shaking the people around me awake and making sure that we're all paying attention. So, so that's really everything I have to say. There are just a couple of things that I, I also want to say is... I made some notes this morning, just points about shock. I think the only bad thing about shock would be a reaction of aversion. But it's talk about a life without aversion. Don't be averse to things. Don't become so reactionary that you shut yourself off. Aversion is a weakness. It's a really knee-jerk response. When you feel aversion coming on, examine it. Flip it around. Do the taxi story in your head and think about that. Shock's the response. It's not the stimulus. Uh, the stimulus is what the artist prepares. It's a presupposition of prejudice. It's a planned attack. Try to understand what the attack was all about. Don't just respond, and you've wasted that opportunity. Um, 
I think shock also provides the cover fire for new ideas. People laughed at Julius Malema when he first arrived. 50,000 people marched this week. Um, shock is a good thorn for thick skin. Get through thick skin, you need a big thorn. Push it hard. And then the degree of shock required is not determined by the person shocking. It's determined by the condition of the people that need to be shocked. Thank you very much. Uh, and, now, and now I think there's supposed to be questions. Five minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thanks for coming. It's I'm pleasure. Pleasure. You talk about uh, the change of and that's often struck me as we need to do it in the country. But now, because we have this incredible separation between the people in this country. For example, I, I cannot contextualize what a guy in the township goes through. I can listen to his problems. Uh, but how do I reach him? Is it up to me to reach him? Is it up to them to reach me? How do we get out of our own circular thinking? Because we can come together and complain about things, but like you said, that doesn't really take it in. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer. I think the answer is, if I look at comedy audiences and how they've evolved, what I've discovered is a band of people that are not one particular cultural or racial, or it's a mindset that's been created by better education, better opportunities. There's a, there's a group of young people that are kind of, my, my feeling is to get to find that group of people that are like-minded, regardless of their background, and apply minds. I don't think it's a question of driving to the township. I mean, you can, you know, like, you, you know, I look after the children of the people who work for me. It's my thing. Like, that's the way I like to do it is make sure they go to school, make sure they've got medical care, blah, blah, because it's a small, it's a small community that I've formed, but it, it, it works. Um, but I, I feel like there's a, there's a mindset of South Africans that's not about race or cultural background. It's about where we want to go forward. I think if we can get those people talking to each other, that's kind of, so, so perhaps this conversation would happen better in your work environment than actually just driving out and trying to help, because there's always the danger that you help you know, two people, and then what the fuck? So my feeling is we've got to try and develop a common mindset, because you're right, we are separated, but isn't that the point? We mustn't be. Do you know what I mean? That's my answer. I don't know if that helps. Cool. Questions? What do your nipples look like? My nipples, they're kind of pink, and they have um, them like bars of uh, bioplastic through them. You didn't expect that much detail. <laughs> I just wanted to cover that so there was no other question about mixing my balls or something. Um, yes? Uh, very good talk. Very, very good talk. Oh, nice. uh, and I'm very interested in critical thinking and, and this and how like, we were, maybe weren't taught as children the way to question things. Mm. And it's great that we're sitting here with this many people in this room having this talk. But how do we get, I mean, I don't think you have the answer, but it's just an interesting question. How do we get critical thinking out there? I mean, do we have to actually instill it in our education system? Or how do we break so the science? Yeah. I don't know um, what the theory is, but the, my only answer to you is question everything. Just question things. Don't just accept, like, just ask why. You know, that's the thing. And if someone says to you, like, they can't give an answer, well, then fuck, it's not good enough. Like, there has to be an answer. So, even the people... Like, kids asking why. Like, we have been out there where parents aren't thinking like that. How do we get that generation of kids... These parents aren't telling me the question, how do we get them to the question? Well, the first thing I think is stop talking to children and speak with them. Like Marilyn Manson said in Burling for Columbine, they said to him, if you could tell those children anything, if you ever met them, what would you tell them? And he said, nothing, I would listen to them. Like, that dude is very clever. And, and I've just, because I'm raising a four, like my own daughter, she's 14 now, and, and things have changed. Like, the, the nature of her questions has changed. Um, I have to question my own ability as a parent. And the one thing I keep doing is questioning my own parenting skills. Like, I just think that deciding that I'm now the right parent would fuck everything up. I don't know. And I'm honest with her that I don't know. So what I'm trying to say is that if we were just more honest with children, because they are people, they've got a mind, they just don't have the 30 years, 40 years of experience that we do, uh, and just pay attention, because they have a beautiful way of like understanding shit that we may have forgotten, or we've been hammered into thinking. See, they don't have apartheid like hard wiring. So, so sometimes they have a better answer than us. Um, and also they understand technology better. So like if I have an issue with one of my gadgets, I was like, just, just explain the shit to me. What, and then they've got it. Like they, 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 they are digital children. They understand the shit. So I don't think it's a, like a process or are we going to fix it like this, but I just think we've got to be better at our own things and then be an example. You know, or, or know when to listen to a kid because they've got fucking great answers. You know, my daughter said the other day, she said, why do you call people black? I was like, what do you mean? She goes, well, you pay for me to go to art classes and I've learned colors. They're brown. 
<laughs> like, fucking great point. <laughs> it's a very good point. Or another one was, uh, a child said, um, someone said to a kid, so in a gay couple, like two men, who's the husband and who's the wife? And the kid said, do you ask chopsticks which is the knife and which is the fork? And I was like... <laughs> I couldn't have thought of that shit. Like that, that has contextualized it for me perfectly. 15. That child was 15. Like fucking blown away. So, so I don't know what the answer is, but I think we just have to be more brave about what we question. And like I said, question your own shit, not other people's. Just interrogate yourself. What do I believe? I've had to think about, what am I teaching this child? She, she needs to know about spiritual shit now. She's more aware of death, that it's all going to end one day. Like she, all of those big things. And like, I've got to have a fucking, I've got to tell her what I think. And, and the truth is, sometimes I go, fuck, man, I don't know. I don't fucking know. I'm now raising an atheist vegetarian, all her own decisions. She's decided that that's the way she wants to go this week. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but I mean, yep. Uh, I wanted to know what, what shocked you or what was the last thing that shocked you? Um, I'll tell you exactly. When I was researching this talk, I, um, I was trawling online just looking for examples of shocking things and as much as I called it a trauma I mean I, I've been watching a lot of the ISIS stuff um, and and um, you know that's that's quite unbelievable um, in terms of actual shocking because that's more traumatic right um, um, shocking would probably have been um, the pictures of Jacob Zuma's house and um, if you spend a quarter of a billion rand and you essentially build a big shithole shit hole, that's shocking that's not acceptable <laughs> Like, it's not even a nice place. It's just a shithole. It's a fucking broken things, cables everywhere. It's just like, dude, seriously, like, you're not even a good crook. What the fuck? So that was probably my last sort of shock to, the, to my system was I thought he built this, like, palatial fucking, you know, like, fucking Dostain abomination. But it's really just a dump. That's when I knew we were in shit in this country. Like, he genuinely doesn't know what the fuck's going on. Yes, sir? Um, what is your... Thoughts Well, it's bad. <laughs> because indoctrination means you are telling people what to think. So you've now lost that mind as an asset. And that's a problem. You, you, you know, you, you, why would you ever want to indoctrinate someone? Because you've removed their right. I mean, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Yeah, basically, regarding we had a fees must fall. Yeah. Uh, if you saw the media, it's where two things appeared. More racism appeared in our country. Yes. And I still don't understand why white people think black people are lazy and yeah. they just want free form. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. So, I mean, w the reason I'm asking you is, so from what point of view do you, do you ask about the indoctrination? Um, I would separate the media from the independent mind, because in this country we don't have a lot of great media. I mean, that's the truth. We talk about the freedom of media, but there's a lot of bullshit media. Yep. You see, indoctrination from the parenting, most of the people here are soon to become parents. Yep. And I believe race gets taught at home. Yes. And indoctrination starts at home more yes. than anywhere else. Yes. And as a parent, what are you doing so that you don't indoctrinate your child? So, I mean, I think everything I was saying would, 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 be, would be part of that solution. I think um, you're absolutely right. I don't think that any parent sets out to sort of radicalize their children. Um, but but the, weight of, the weight of what's come before sits quite heavy. What we need to do is lighten that weight. Make your own decisions as a parent, not your parents' decision. So that's very important. But then we must ask ourselves the question of where do we draw the line? Because for you, race is very pertinent. For me, I would ask you the same as a father. Would you say that it's okay for your son to go and get his knob sliced with a dirty blade or that he believes in a little man under the bed? You see, what I'm saying is there's a cultural and then there's, a, there's an ideological. It's div you know, that's everyone's choice as to what they... If somebody in this room wants to raise a racist, we can't stop them. I just don't think it's a constructive move. Do you know what I mean? Because I think we're looking for a blanket solution, and I, I don't think that exists. I think it comes down to every individual. So I think it's up to us as individuals to be better people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll talk to you after it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot.
Um, well, John managed to go all the way back in his slides again, so I'm not going to try to get to mine. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, John asked me to tell you that he likes um, physical contact. So if as many of you can try and touch him as possible, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, Rad, so that, that ends this month's Creator Mornings. Uh, we're going to have slightly earlier next month. I think it's the 20th. Don't quote me on that. Um, so thank you for coming. And go get another free cup of coffee.